Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today, I'm chatting with Kevin Kelly. In the best of all possible ways, Kevin is extremely difficult to describe or introduce. I pulled a little bit from Wikipedia. It says, Kevin Kelly is the founding executive editor of Wired Magazine, a former editor-publisher of the Whole Earth Review. He's also been a writer, photographer, conservationist, and student of Asian and digital culture, yet it still feels that barely scratches the surface. Most recently, Kevin has a new book out, which I recommend, Excellent Advice for Living, Wisdom I Wish I'd Known Earlier. Kevin, welcome. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to this. Let's start with some questions about your new book. Which is the piece of advice you were afraid to give and did not give? I'm afraid to give very much um, marriage counseling, kind of um, things to way to run your marriage. I gave one piece about uh, every now and then rotate in letting your partner be always right. A piece of advice that I would be hesitant to talk about is um, like, here's one. I think um, if you should have as many kids as you possibly can. That's a piece of advice I did not include in the book. If advice is of positive expected value, why be afraid to give marital advice? Because um, I don't have enough experience in, in, in standing up to it. So, so I only put pieces of advice that I felt I could really stand by. And there were times when I doubted my own um, my own certainty about it. What do you feel has been the worst piece of advice you ever gave? <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Um, something that I changed my mind about, maybe. Um, I think... Uh, I might have. Been, I think I would advise someone when I was at Wired to um, to 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 accept to do some things that they were not inclined to do, and I said that you kind of kind of you know do one for the team kind of a thing, and I felt in retrospect that that was maybe dishonest in the sense that I would not have done that myself, and so I was sort of advising something to do something that I would not have done. Maybe it was good for them, but I wasn't certain about that. So I would say that was a p bad piece of advice. Here's a piece of advice. Tell me if it's good or bad. Quote, minimize deathbed regret. I think that's good advice. Why is it good? Won't it lead you to do too many things just so you don't regret having missed out, but in fact a lot of it just amounts to nothing? Um, not necessarily. Um, I, I think minimizing your regrets is, is um, a good thing. And most, most regrets that people have are from things that they, not from things that they did, but from things that they didn't do. And so I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of somebody who, who really regretted having done too much in their lives. Um, I think I've, I've not met anybody who's ever told me that. I've met people who told me that they regretted not doing things. So I think minimizing regrets is still a good idea. Why is the ex post perspective better than the ex ante? If so many people at the end feel they haven't done enough, at the time they probably had pretty good reasons not to do it, right? If it's such a common phenomenon. And at the end of your life, it seems mm -hmm. like it would have been easy to have done it because you're no longer faced with all the costs. Yeah, I, I, I think I think that would be true, but I think most people um, wind up not doing very much, not because they had good reasons to, but because um, it was easier or, 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 or that it um, was inconvenient at the time. And I think sometimes the best things that we do are not necessarily convenient. So I, I think um, if there was legitimate reason for not getting things done, then, then people probably wouldn't have regret about it. I think the reason they do have regrets is that they understood that the reasons for not doing it were really not really valid. If someone asks you for advice on, how do I get better at following advice? What do you tell them? <laughs> um, advice. So I think you get, uh, a good way to use advice is to try uh, to use it as a reminder. Most of the advice, here's, here's a piece of advice, is that 
everything um, everything good has already been said, but we just need to say it again. People weren't listening. So a lot of advice is really kind of reminders of, of things that we kind of already know. And so I think a good way to, to, to pay attention to advice is to encapsulate it in some way that you can remember and to remind yourself. So they're really should be called maybe reminders. What should institutions do to, in essence, subsidize advice or encourage it? Oh, that's a good question. I think, um, is there anything institutions can do? Well, institutions like an educational institution, I think, um, it, would, it would help them in terms of education to um, work on life skills and um, learning how to, to, you know, cultivate good habits versus bad habits. Um, uh, trying to um, guide people with, with heuristics that when they confront things that are unclear, that they have a kind of a general heuristic to help them get through it. That's kind of advice. So I think the educational system could incorporate the idea of advice into its curriculum as a way of helping um, young people develop these, these principles in their own lives that they could be reminded of. How many people asking for advice actually want advice? And to the extent yeah. they don't, what is it they're looking for? People write me for advice every day, and at least half the time, I feel maybe they want the feeling of having asked me rather than the advice. Now, I'm happy to supply them with that feeling, but yeah, maybe I, it's I just it's process they're maximizing. I think you're right. I, I think that um, sometimes people are looking for confirmation about things that they've already decided. Sometimes they're actually looking for justification for something they've already decided. Um, and I think um, sometimes they are actually looking for attention, but I, I, I think there's a sense of maybe um, confirmation. They're, um, I don't, I'm not sure how much people are actually looking for information f from, from this. The kind of advice that I get from people um, writing are usually young people who are trying to decide about you know, where to go, what to study. And they're kind of wanting to hear from an adult some sense of whether something is valuable or not, and they don't know. And so that kind of advice, uh, I'm very reluctant to give and almost never answer because I don't feel I know that person well enough. I can give them a platitude like <laughs> my book is filled with saying, here's my a piece of advice for a young person who is um, studying out. And I would say, my piece of advice to them, somebody I don't know, is try to work on an area where there's no words for what it is that you do. And I would say that's my advice. You said that to Noah Smith in that interview. But if I'm a young person and then I say, well, how do I operationalize that? What do I do in the morning? Do I put that on my LinkedIn profile? <laughs> how do they make that concrete? Yeah. So, 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 so basically, it's sort of what you're not doing. It's like... Um, um, and, 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 and it, it's not going to be instant, but it, but it's a journey, and, and that's a really important thing. Is that the general drift of, of one's life is is going to be a direction rather than a destination. And I think um, you you say well, accounting account things that I know about are things that are um, probably not where I should be headed, even though I may start there. That's not where I really want to go. And, and I make another piece of advice, which is it doesn't really matter where you really begin because that's not where you're going to end up. So, so the idea is, well, I might study accounting, but I intend not to, to, to dwell there for very long because I want to head out into the frontier where there's something. So I would say it's an ongoing process where you're asking yourself, um, is this someone else's idea of success? What's buried in me that I can do? that may be a little bit different than others. Now, when you were in your 20s, you hitchhiked to work, I understand. Yeah. Do you advise the same to your grandkids or forthcoming grandkids? Um, I, it was all I could do to try to get them to ride a bicycle to work. So, so um, my, I actually accompanied my son a couple of times. It was a pretty long haul, I have to say that. But um, I um, really, was urging them to be independent in that sense of even getting to work. And um, uh, I thought a, a bicycle was more appropriate for where they had to go. I'm not sure that they could have um, hitchhiked to work these days, but I like the idea of trying to be as independent as possible when you were young. Now, my favorite creation of yours probably is this three volume set. It's called Vanishing Asia. 
if I understand correctly, it was a 50-year project based around roughly 200,000 photos. It's three volumes. It's one of the greatest picture books ever produced, possibly the greatest, and that in turn makes it one of the greatest books ever produced. So just a few simple questions about that. 200,000 photos. Where in Asia do people most like being photographed and where do they like it the least? Mm. And why? Uh, well, so first of all, the kind of photography I do is, is sometimes called street photography. It's, um, it's candid. Um, th there are some portraits, but most of the time people are often not even aware that I'm photographing them. Um, other times when I kind of ask permission, although I would often shoot first and ask questions later. Um, and I would say um, places, uh, actually, in some ways, China was very easy to photograph people um, without much resistance or hesitation. They were, they, they seemed to be comfortable, even if they weren't that familiar with cameras. Um, the, I think there was something about the sense of privacy being expanded uh, and, and larger range there or their sense of privacy being smaller in that sense. I think the hardest place to photograph people certainly were in some of the Islamic countries um, where women were off limits, basically, um, for most of, of photography. Um, and even where um, um, men were, 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 were shy or there was some kind of a civil unrest and so there was suspicion there and I'm thinking of like Eastern Turkey um, and some other places in northern Pakistan at one point where there was a suspicion of anybody with a camera. In 2023, where is the best place to see Vanishing Asia now? Mm. So my book kind of records the places in the world that um, there are still remnants of a traditional culture where people are, are wearing, the, the, the ideal place, they're still wearing costumes because that's the first to go. You know, adopting machine-made Western dress, which is the cheapest kind of clothing you can buy, is the first kind of traditional indigenous culture to, to, to disappear. And so where are they still wearing native costumes in that way? Um, one is in um, Myanmar, where there's a lot of very traditional culture. It's the one that least developed and kind of isolated up in the mountains. So that's one place you could go to see kind of vanishing Asia. Um, and even places in um, Afghanistan, despite the troubles in the wars, it is so poor that um, there are still areas that have not been developed and there's still a lot of very traditional culture and costume there. And of course, I don't recommend going there, but <laughs> it's possible. And why are costumes the first thing to vanish? You know, because here's what it is. The amount of effort required to make clothing by hand is so enormous. I mean, the traditional way you make clothing is you make fibers, you know, from wool, you, you spin the threads, then they have to make into a loom. It is an enormous amount of energy to make clothing by hand. And so it's much cheaper to, to, to buy cloth. That's one of the first things that people do when they have the ability to have money is that they buy clothing rather than make it themselves. And if they're not making, um, if you're not taking the homemade cloth and making it into the, your native costume, um, and you're buying a shirt, it just, it's just easier to put on a shirt, t-shirt, cotton t-shirt, which you can almost get for free. Um, and so it just, it, the, the costumes just disappear because they're not making the entire cloth and fabric by hand. And other than a camera, what is it that you need to pack? And what can you do without that would surprise us? Yes. Um, I take very, very, very little. Um, the, in addition to a change of clothes, which is basically all I have, some soap powder, I'd have um, my camera equipment. I, these days, I carry a little portable pharmacy, a medical kit, because that's often in short supply. And it's not even just for me, it's for those around me. Things, basic things like, you know, ibuprofen, aspirin, those kinds of stuff, um, antibiotics. So, so um, things that we might need in an emergency. So the medical kit is one thing. Um, other, I, I had a few little duct tape <laughs> tools that are essential 
to keeping things going, um, some super glue. And, uh, you know, these days, once photography turned digital, uh, a lot of what I carry is power packs, extension cords, you know, backup drives and that kind of stuff. Um, beyond that, oh, yes, there is one thing. I'm sorry. One vital thing that I carry with me everywhere, even today, and that is mosquito netting. I have a little portable mosquito netting in my luggage at all time because I'm very allergic to, to mosquitoes. It's not even necessarily the, the disease aspect, but I, I, I'm allergic to them. I wake up if I'm bit. So I put up my mosquito netting and carry it with me everywhere. And even when people say there's no mosquitoes here, they're wrong, I'll still put it up. What do you do for books? I have um, a, a Kindle, um, and that's mostly what I use for books when I'm traveling. Before that time, I usually had a paperback. Um, and um, I often, believe it or not, read books on my phone. Do you ever feel that if you don't photograph a place, you haven't really <laughs> been there? Does it hold a different yes. status? Like you haven't organized the information? It's just out on Pluto somewhere? Yes, I did. I. Uh, when I was younger, I had um, a religious conversion and I decided to ride my bicycle across the U.S. And part of that problem, part of the thing was I was on my way to die and I decided to leave my camera behind for, for this magnificent journey of a bicycle across in the U.S. And it was the most difficult thing I ever did because I was just imagining all the magnificent pictures that I could take that I, weren't, that I wasn't going to take. I, I took a sketchbook instead. And that kind of appeased some of my desire to capture things visually. Um, but you're absolutely right. It was in a kind of a little bit of an addiction where the framing of a photograph was how I saw the world, still images. And I was basically in my head clicking. I was clicking the shutter at the right moments when something would happen. Um, and that I think was not necessarily healthy to be so dependent on that framing to, 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 to enjoy the world. And, and I've learned to wean myself off from that necessity. To, to So now I can travel with just a phone um, for the, you know, the selfies that you might want to take. But maybe the earlier habit was better. But I sometimes think your fundamental contribution, if I try to tie together all the different things you've done, including your very long list of reviews of documentaries, your work for the All Species Foundation, uh, Wired, your writings on tech, your blogging basically every day for 20 years. Is your true innovation some new way of organizing information and you're just applying it to all these different areas? Vanishing Asia, right? 200,000 photos. I, I, I see my skill as a packager of ideas in, in a very visual way, and that was the, the fun of Wired. It was, it, was, it was actually experimenting with what could you do with cheap color printing. Um, and uh, the web, moving on to digital and the web and things like that is an extension of that kind of a packaging of ideas. I, 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 I'm reluctant to assign any kind of large general thesis to all the things I'm interested in because... Um, I think it's just a pure reflection of my own idiosyncratic interests in the world. And I'm not sure that there's a bigger thing connecting them all together. But is the bigger thing some insight about how packaging helps you frame the content? And you're trying to teach people that in a lot of different ways. It might be. Um, um, and maybe I'm not self-aware enough to, 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 to see that. But um, I, I, for me, there is a joy in, in, in that marriage of text and images and these days moving images you know I, I do one bit of art a day for for the past year I was making it myself this year I'm using co-generating with AI posting one new image a day and there is for me um, a, a a supreme joy in in packaging ideas my own or other people in an artful way to you know I'm I'm a book lover. I'm a magazine lover. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a website lover. So, um, so maybe they do. Maybe that is the, the fundamental impetus is um, presenting things that are conceptual in a visual way. Are you happier when you travel or do you travel for other reasons? Um, 
I'm very happy when I'm traveling. I'm, I'm very content. Um, I, I think I was a little frantic. People didn't like to travel with me often because I really literally was working from morning to night. I wasn't relaxing, hanging around the pool. Uh, and even when I was visiting things, I was on the hunt for these images. I have since learned to take a different mode, but I am very, very happy because uh, uh, I, I like to kind of travel that's not for relaxation and not so much for rejuvenation, but for learning. And so I'm happiest when I am encountering things I've never seen before, making me question and change my mind and try to understand things. And that makes me supremely happy and content. So I can just keep going and going, and particularly in situations where I'm learning the entire time. We're very similar in this way, but I sometimes think most people don't actually enjoy their so-called vacations more. They don't enjoy it when they travel. They may do it for social bonding or they feel they're supposed to or they don't know what else to do with themselves. But it's a funny thing to spend so much money on something that makes you less happy. And that's what I yeah. observe. Yeah, th that's true. And, and, and there, are, there, are, there is a kind of travel where people are kind of being rejuvenated and, and restored where they may have to relax or be pampered or in some ways enjoy a level of living that they no don't normally get to. But that's not, I mean, I can partake in it, but that's not the reason why I go out. I head out to confront the other, the otherness in the world and to have that kind of um, come back with um, a new sense of who I am, a new sense of what's possible. What's the biggest travel mistake you make repeatedly? Um, trying to trying to do too much. I, 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 I've learned a little bit better, but I, but, but I am very ambitious in, in that. And it's particularly if I'm with other people like my family. Um, so I have to like, repeatedly try to accomplish too much. And I don't, and I've learned not to kind of travel around. I'm, 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 when I go somewhere, I'm very content to kind of not travel within a country, but to travel around where I am in that, to kind of exploit that. But still, I, I want to keep going. I'm a little, you know, and so I, I, I for the sake of others and for my own sake, I've tried to, to slow down a little bit, um, but I keep making the mistake of trying to do too much. It doesn't yet sound like a mistake to me, I have to say, right? <laughs> Well, um, your mis our, our mistakes may not be the same. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, because there's a value, uh, here's what it is, is it, it, and that is something related to what I say, is, is that um, there's a tendency to always want to keep moving, but often what I'm looking for is right next to me. And so, um, and so, and so I can sometimes miss that ability to kind of go deeper because I'm still, still traveling, I'm still in that motion mode. I sometimes think my biggest mistake is going too many times to the same places because a city like London or New York, yeah. you'll get a lot of good invitations, sure. right? And it's hard to say no to them and you, you love those cities, but you could just head off to say Caribbean coast of yeah. Honduras or something rather yes. than going there. Yeah, I, I ha I'm not making that mistake. So, so I, um, th that hasn't been a mistake, but, but yes, I can see that. Um, if you're not making that mistake, what's your algorithm for deciding where to travel next? That's a great question. Um, what, w one of them is, is uh, um, looking for these little pockets of the world where there is more otherness than others. I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in going places that are very different, tempered with the, with the ease of travel. So there are places of the world that are very different that require kind of girding up, you know, Sudan, Chad, whatever it is. and. Um, where it's not going to be necessarily an easy entry, an easy time. So I'm trying to balance the ease of getting somewhere with the surprise and value of being somewhere very, very different. And um, I'm looking for those kind of places where there's the right combination of those. Here's another systematic mistake I make. When I imagine places like that in advance, I think they're much more difficult than they usually turn out to be. Yeah. That's so I, I went to Gondar, Ethiopia. At first I was thinking, oh, that's so nearly impossible. Will I even get there? And in fact, it was all super easy and relaxing. Yeah. Um, so, so, so I think that is a mistake maybe that I make is um, 
believing things were more difficult than they actually are, if, if you actually get there. Um, I have a friend who keeps convincing me I should go back to Afghanistan. And so, oh, so really, it's really, you know, perfectly, uh, well, I don't know. I'm not really sure if I'm ready for that. <clears throat> Paper maps or GPS, which is better? Um, GPS is better. Um, I, I don't, I have a drawer full of fabulous maps that I don't even take with me anymore. Paper maps. <clears throat> Don't, um, don't you like the feeling that you figured out where everything is when you use a paper map? You don't get that from GPS? Yeah, I, I don't get it, but I don't miss I mean, it's not, it's not as important as actually knowing where I am and having a track <laughs> of it. What are the best books to read while you're traveling? I um, tend to really read about the place I'm in and as much as I can. And it's really weird because I find that often I'm not really interested or willing to read about it unless I am there. But once I am there, I have an insatiable appetite for finding out about the history, whatever was going on, other people's view of it, that kind of is not present when I'm not there. So I tend almost exclusively to read about where I am. I tend to read about where I'm going in advance a lot. No, I don't. But once I'm there, I read for offset. So I'll pick yeah. some classic book that has nothing to do with the place where I'm at. Yeah. Um, I, have, I haven't been able to do that. That's not how my brain works for some reason. I also find after I've been to a place, when I then process subsequent news stories about that place, I just remember them much better. So one reason I go places is to be able to read news about those places and have it make some kind of sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's like right now, if, and, and I also feel that um, I have a better image of, of its relationship with all the stuff around it, which has a huge influence. And so that kind of cartographic intelligence um, is really, really supreme. So if you've been to some places and you kind of have an idea of how far away the other related places are, that gives you an intuitive sense of, of that news. And um, it's absolutely true that that is um, a, a way, and, and, and there's an interest too, because I've been there and so I'm kind of curious about, um, you know, it's like having met someone, you're now interested, in, you're vested into their story. And if visiting a country deeply, you're now vested into their story. Which is your favorite part of India? One way to answer that is where have I returned to the most? And that would be Rajasthan. That was because it was the most colorful, photogenic, um, in some ways intact, uh, of the places. My second favorite is Kerala um, for a similar reason. Those two areas have I've returned to the most often because um, there was photographically for me um, this little bit of the kind of the vanishing Asia, the intact traditions, the culture, the ceremonies, uh, the festivals, the everyday dress um, was supreme. And I'm sorry to say I'd probably go back again there before other places in India. Traveling with kids, what's the secret? I know you've done it. Many yeah. people are afraid. What's your advice, if I may put it that um, way? The, the advice is simply do it. Uh, um, I, it was, for us, it was f there were far less issues or troubles than, than we imagined. I know one concern people have is about health. And so um, um, that Frankly, you've never had any kind of disaster, but I can see why that might be very stressful if, if there were. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see the difficulty in it. It was been very, very easy to do it. And we had our kids in very, very remote places. I would say one thing, that when they were younger, they were often overwhelmed by the stuff. Like I took my young girls by myself to parts of Tibet when it was very, very rough and tumble. And they were a little intimidated by the huge Tibetans and the strangeness of it. And I felt in some ways it was kind of a failure because they were they would rather play cards on the train than look out the window. And it was like, you're missing this. You're like, this, is, this is the Himalayas, whatever. And so, um, but what, what I found out was, was they later on, they, they didn't have enough to process what it was and it was later on that that trip, those trips became more and more important to them as they were able to kind of 
digest it and process it. So even though, though they did, maybe didn't appreciate it at the time or seemed to be paying attention, they were actually reprocessing it later as they grew up and those trips became more important to them than they were at the time. So I would say one thing, one piece of advice is if your kids don't seem to appreciate it, it doesn't matter, they'll probably appreciate it later on. And as you reprocess your own travel experiences, are you more impressed or struck by the unity of mankind or the diversity? Yeah, that's a good question. I had an epiphany recently about that, and that was um, at the at the at the you know Maslow's hierarchy of, of of needs, which he never really made into a pyramid, but we all imagine it as a pyramid. At the base of the kind of satisfying our need for shelter and clothing and basic uh, water and food. At that lower level, the entire world is converging on a uniform basic needs. So, so everybody in the world wants to live in an airtight, air-conditioned concrete box that has Wi-Fi. And it's looking very similar. But I believe that at the higher levels of actualization and, and what it all means, I'm seeing um, a diversity in the world. And so I think there's a commonality that we all share fundamentally um, more than, than ever at, 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 the, at, the, at the base level of our genetic bodies and, and basic human needs, but that there's weirdly uh, a, a diversity of differences in kind of what it means to us and how we make value and the kinds of things that we find important or not. And, 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 so, and so, yes, there's two things going on. There's this huge commonality, and then there, there is this difference that, that we find important. I think travel has helped me to see just how much virtually all squabbles are petty squabbles. Because yeah. you go to other places and you hear them talk about what they're squabbling about. Like, oh, you know, what kind of music should you play in the church ceremony? And you think of it, well, that's a petty squabble. And you're right, but your own squabbles are not less petty. And that's the unity I come away thinking more about after a lot of trips. Yeah, and, and, and I think for me, the overwhelming lesson about those kinds of travel for me has been at how, um, uh, what's the word I want? Um, you know, basically most people in the world are fairly racist, sexist, um, suspicious, suspicious of strangers and stuff. And so relative to, to the rest of the world, the U.S. is doing pretty good. That's one of the things I come back is, is that this is the, the, gen the general thing that we're trying to move from was the norm for most of the world, for most of history. And so um, what, the, the, the kind of elevated society that we want is 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 um, compared to the rest of the world a pretty good deal some tech questions what in tech should we be paying more attention to um tech in general i i, I think um let, let me put it this way there was a technology that I thought was 100 years off that I'm now convinced is much closer than I thought, and that is the um, brain-computer interface. Neuro, you know, Elon Musk's Neuralink and others, there's a whole field of people who are doing, and having gone to visit to see their work, I've been really shocked that they're much further along in being able to uh, bypass our fingers in order to actually communicate via computer. And I thought, again, that that was going to be way off, but it looks like that could be within 25 years, um, which was a shock to me. So I, I would say that's one place that you, you might be looking for, for things that could happen in that kind of suddenly, even though it's been going on for, you know, the research has been going on for decades. And that, and, and that would really kind of shake things up if, if, if that was to happen. And how would that change people's lives? Say your grandkids, what, what, how will it matter for them? So I think at first, of course, it's going to be mostly, and that's what they're aiming at, is, is you know, in, in disabled, you know. Oh, sure, but for non, non-disabled individuals. Right, right, exactly. Right, how will right. it matter? I, th I think what it matters is um, a, a, a way of um, auxiliary. I don't think it's going to necessarily replace typing, but I think 
it'll be um, another way of interfacing with the, the, the technology that we want to do. So, so one of the dreams that Jaron Lanier and others have had with virtual reality is being able to create, paint things as fast as we could think of them. So there could be a way in which we are generating content faster and more easily than the laborious way we have right now of having to put things into language. Into, so there may be some way to kind of like post symbolically skip some of the language framing that we do to, to make, say, an image. So, so this is something I've learned recently about making daily um, AI art, which is that theoretically these machines can make any possible image and they can at the back engine. The real shock that we've had right now is we've now suddenly have the conversational user interface. We now have an ability to use conversation as an interface to the AI capabilities. But here's what happens is we're using a conversational interface to try to make art, but there's a lot of art that humans create that can't be reduced to language. You can't get there by using language. So there's art that I've been trying to make and I realize that I'm never going to be able to make it with an AI because I need language to get there and there's lots of things that we can't get to with language. And so that's one way in which this kind of human computer interface could, could, could make a new frontier is enabling us to do things where we can kind of bypass language and, and work with maybe emotions or other kind of intuitions or things that we don't even have language for because we're actually tapping into the brain directly. But do you ever find that, say, you need to write a piece to figure out what you think about something? Or maybe Absolutely. it's the act of painting that is giving you the idea of the image, and there's no way to reverse engineer that. Absolutely. I, I write in order to think. I, that, that's how I think. I think by writing. I don't have the ideas and, and then sit down and try to write them. I, I, I use writing to get the ideas. And I think painting certainly may be part of that or, 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 or rendering it, making visual. But that's the point is that that may be something that we can do without having to go through language or our fingers to get there. And so um, for the grandchildren, uh, this ability, you know, for maybe playing games or maybe creating things or maybe walking through this virtual metaverse space, this may be an interface to it that's very different from the interfaces that we have right now. How will recent developments in AI alter our understanding of God and religion? Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think um, the moment that one of our created beings sa says, I have a soul. Um, They've said it already, right? I don't believe them, but they already <laughs> say it if you ask right, them Right, exactly, right. I have a soul, you have to believe me, and here's why I believe it, and they want to be baptized. So um, I, I, I think that is um, um, really, really important. In fact, I've been working on this project called A Catechism for Robots. And it's sort of a, it's half in jest, but it's 80% uh, serious about trying to have answers, theological, cosmic answers, for the beings that we create when they want to know why we created them and um, to what purpose. And um, so I think the role of AI, first of all, I think it's instrumental in, in us deciding who we are and who we want to be. And I think that will um, impact our ideas of, of God and our understandings of because we are going to be gods ourselves. I mean, that, that, that's the major thing is that our act of creating these beings, we will be godlike and that's going to illuminate to us our notions of what being godlike is like. So Christianity in particular, how will it change? The, the idea of a demiurge will become more important? You know, I, 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 I don't know how Christianity itself will, will change. I think that, um, you know, the Christian creed is that humans are made in the image of God. And therefore, since God is creator and made other beings like us, that this could reinforce the idea of, um, of demigods and that we are um, God-like. We're fulfilling the, the commandment to be like God by creating other beings. And so we might have to have, you know, um, some, what's the word I want? 
guidance, some principles about, well, here's how to be a good God based on biblical principles. That's, that's a possibility. I think one of the things we see, the trends in Christianity is increasing number of sects and divisions and schisms. And so it's possible that there could be a sect derived around AI and the ability of making and guiding and creating other beings. What would be a technology that you refuse to use and why? I wouldn't, well, if there was uh, weaponization of, 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 of technology is, is something that I um, shy from. So uh, if there was, you know, uh, I, I personally am not going to use um, uh, technologies that were like a gun, like a better gun. Oh, if sure. There was, in more ordinary life, say, I, I won't use a microwave. I feel it makes people lazy in their cooking. Oh, let's see. What's your analog? I also won't, you know, kill someone with an atom bomb, but... I mean, I can tell you something right now is I don't have social media on my phone. But you okay? use it. But I use it. I use it on my desktop, but I don't use it on my phone. Um, so is there a technology that I would not use? Um, so, so, okay, I, I don't want to be the first to, to, to use the brain computer interface. I'm not going to be the first to be jacked in. I might use it if uh, many if my friends all used it and they lived. I think um, I'd be very hesitant to use certain kind of genetic uh, germline um, uh, alterations. Uh, I'm not sure I would say no, but I would certainly be very, very, very hesitant about that. I think we have to be very cautious. So there are things that I'm cautious about, and I would say, well, uh, I let me see how this is the Amish. This is the Amish take on how they do it. Let me see how other people are doing it and how it affects their lives before I decide to to do it. And if there was generally positive results in their own lives and around them as society, then I might adopt it. So um, uh, I can't think of something that I absolutely would not do at all. What's the most surprising fact you know about the Amish? Um, they are adopting cell phones. So let me, let me, let me, you know, uh, caveat that the Amish decide to use technology by parish by parish. So it's a very decentralized way. And there's many different varieties and many different sects. And the more generally, the most liberal ones are the more at the core of where Lancaster County and where the Amish began, the, some of the most, uh, rigid and ones that are more or fashion are actually further away, like in upstate New York or other places. And so, um, um, but generally th they have, um, are, uh, have decided kind of that, that cell phones are appropriate technology and they are often are flip phones and not even smartphones. And that um, is appropriate for them because um, it, they find that it keeps their families together. And what they're doing is they're spreading um, around the country, buying up cheap farmland, and they have a cell, a certain number of families they need to have as a minimum, and to keep in contact with their families further back away from where they have left, they finding that the cell phones help strengthen their families. So that's a surprising fact that most people don't know. Now, as you know, non-Amish birth rates are both low and falling. Yeah. So what is the mechanism that caps the percentage of Amish in, say, the American population? Or does it just asymptotically approach one? My, my, one of the scenarios for the future of the U.S. is that basically the Amish take over all the farmland. And um, because right now the Amish are continually to expand. They, their attrition rate is still very low. Attrition meaning the number of kids that they have that don't um, go back, don't stay with the church. Um, it's still only a few percent. Um, so Amish always buy land. They've never sold land. They're, they're, they're still expanding. And it's possible to imagine them taking over the rural areas over time. So I don't see any much of a cap right now in the current um, birth rates that they have, given the birth rates of the rest of the U.S. Um, I think it's a very viable scenario is that most of the rural farmlands is being run by the Amish. And you don't think there's a scaling problem. So if someone says, oh, America, it could have 60 million Amish, you think that's an equilibrium, at least potentially? Or does being Amish somehow fray when the numbers are so large, 
s such a diverse group. They have so much contact right. with the outside world. Yeah, well, the, the, there may be limits because right, right, the big cash crop for most Amish is actually dairy. And there's a limit on the amount of dairy that we're going to consume. Um, but they're, um, they're really good at that kind of um, small holdings, animal raising, combined with raising the food for the animals. So I would say maybe as long as they're actually consumption of meat and animal products, um, the Amish, but there might be some limit to the amount that, that um, we as a society are consuming. Um, it, perhaps if there was really good animal cell based meat prevalent and animal cell based milk prevalent, that maybe then the Amish are capped. How would society most change if we simply could double or triple our amount of long term thinking? So I'm involved in this group called the Law Now Foundation, where we're trying to promote long term thinking. And I think the way it would change is that um, there would be a couple of um, things. One is I think we would we would collectively, maybe mostly through government, um, have more long term research involved, and the benefits of that would be, be spilling over to everything. So most science experiments today last as long as a PhD which is like four years. And um, there's very little really long range research being done. Uh, and then secondly, um, there's very little projects that might take 25 years or more to do, whether infrastructural or otherwise. Um, and, and more of those garnered by a number of people who understand that there may be, that there's a benefit to having payoffs come not just for the current generation, but future generations. Um, would allow longer term, maybe even bigger kind of projects to become more normal and conventional than they are right now. Um, and then thirdly, I think um, thinking in terms of generations rather than just the immediate next quarter or next year, um, I think that also um, would enable us to um, manage the planet in, in a better way, because lots of the kind of planetary things that we're interested in and, and, and I'm paying attention to have a longer range dynamic than just the immediate year or two, the, the short now, we call it. So, uh, so I think individually, for, for individuals, I think that that's not maybe necessarily going to change their own lives, but I think it changes our lives at the civilizational level. Of all the people you have known, who is it that has handled power the best? <laughs> people that I have known. Um, I know Jerry Brown a little bit, and I've been very, I was very impressed with, with him. He was in the leadership in California and was doing well. Um, I hear somebody. I... Um, I know Jeff Bezos, and I actually been very impressed with Jeff Bezos. The more I know him, the more I'm, the more I admire him. And I think um, he's very fast to own up to mistakes and to take um, responsibility. Um, I think he is uh, very aware and and sensible. And I think in, in my own observation. I think he's working very hard to um, deal with the responsibility that great power comes from. And so I would say Jeff Bezos. What film has most expanded your conception of what reality is? Mm. Um, most expanded my conception of reality. Boy, I'm not sure that I've seen a film that's changed my idea about reality. Um, they are actual, they, after all, they're just fictional. I mean, you know, I, I would say, uh, um, you know, seeing 2001 by Kubrick expanded my idea of what's possible. And maybe that's, maybe that's a, an aspect of reality is believing what's possible. So I, 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 found, I found that that sort of that vision was exhilarating at the time. 
of, and this is, you know, kind of pre-Star Wars, but I have to say Star Wars itself, the idea of kind of the worn and old future, that that shifted my idea and expanded my possibilities, uh, my idea of what's, what's possible as well. So, so, so I've, I think maybe the idea of a future that was worn and used and not just kind of streamlined, I think that, that did shift my idea of, of, of reality. Which is the most underrated documentary? Mm. I, <clears throat> um, there, was a, there was a documentary called King of Kong, which was about the uh, champion um, uh, King Kong um, video game. And what was underrated about it and what was fabulous about this movie was that there was a villain there's not that many documentaries that have villains. And here was a villain, and they were, they were filming. The villain basically gave him access because to the, his whole side of it. And even though he was incredibly villainous and scheming and just underhanded, he didn't think he was, but it was very obvious to everybody else he was. And so that made it a really fabulous documentary because you've got a villain in there, and you're seeing the villain the whole time. So I think that's underrated. I love that movie, by the way. I also quite like Werner Herzog's the German language version of Little Dieter Needs to Fly. Do you know that I one? I only see on the English version. Um, how, why is the German version better? Just deeper, more authentic, more morally ambiguous. Uh, feels more Herzogian. So that would be a favorite of mine. What is something unusual that you measure about yourself? So I, I and my partner, um, Gary Wolf, we began the quantify self movement of this idea of using technology to measure ourselves, to quantify our lives, to do things. And I was very much doing that in the beginning. And I don't measure almost anything about myself these days. And uh, the reason why I shifted in that was it turned out to be very easy to generate the data the metrics, the information, the measurements. But it became really, really hard to make sense out of it, to, to get meaning out of it. And what it, what it needed is what we're about to have, which is it needed AIs to digest the huge ocean of data that was generating to really make sense of the patterns and things that, that are not obvious, that we can't see, that aren't intuitive. And so... At a certain level, there's a, what I discovered, like say, counting my steps, is I actually counted it long enough and measured it long enough that I can actually, to own within 100 steps, tell you how many steps it took today because I was correlating all those measurements with, with my own experience. And so to go beyond that, um, it, it, just, it, it just needs uh, cheap, ubiquitous AI to kind of monitor these this stream of data and to try and help extract out some meaning from that. That has not yet happened. And because it hasn't, I haven't been measuring very much at all about my life. Way back when, why is it you dropped out of University of Rhode Island? Yes. This was in 1971. Um, had there been at that time a gap year or internships, I would have done that, and that's what I needed, and I would have gone back, I, 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 I suspect. But there wasn't such a thing, and it felt like grade 13. I was sitting in the same desks with the same routine, and what I needed was uh, to do a project. I, 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 I needed to, to, to just get out of my seat and do stuff, and um, there wasn't any option at that time to do that. So I, I dropped out. and. In retrospect, I regret having even spent that one year there. What was the job you took after dropping out? My job was to go to Asia and to photograph. And I didn't know what I was going to do there, what, what I was going to photograph, but I wanted to be a photographer. I actually, I actually called up National Geographic. I was like a 19-year-old you know, or whatever. I called up National Geographic and I said, I'm going to go to Taiwan and Japan. Uh, do you need any photographs? I found I found a photo editor from the, in the phone book, and he graciously said, "You know, it doesn't work that way. But when you come back, 
show me your photographs and we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there. And he was good to his word and I did. So I was, I was, I, I, I decided to, 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 to photograph, um, and become a photographer. That was what my, my dream was. I hesitate to use such a general phrase, but the world of tech, what was your first entry point into that? Yeah. So I had a, I had a kind of a hippie-ish attitude. Um, you know, and when I was dropping out, I was very influenced by the whole earth catalog. I believed what it said that you should kind of invent your own life and that all these things were possible. And so, um, I had a very arm's length. I, I owned nothing. I was very suspicious of c computers, which my dad worked with, and um, uh, not interested. You know, I was kind of the small is beautiful take. I was Thoreau was my hero in high school. You know, building your own house, living in a little simple life. That was my. That was that I believe was my destination. That changed um, when I came back. And I, um, from traveling, I graduated, I say, I graduated from traveling and decided to, to, um, to try to make a, a living somehow or other. And I decided, I did a mail order catalog of travel books. I had, I had discovered all these really interesting books when I was traveling that were not available in the U.S. There was this um, guy named Rick Steves who was self-publishing a book about Europe, Europe through the sure. back door. And there was um, Tony and Maureen Wheeler who had a little stapled book called Lonely Planet Shoestring Guide to the Southeast Asia. And I was importing them, in my little catalog. And so um, I got, I worked in a, I worked at the University of Georgia in the science lab. And there was an Apple IIe there that um, was used in the lab for data stuff. And I got a modem for it and I started to send information from my the little catalog I was making to a local newspaper to have a typeset. But I discovered that there was this bulletin board world on the inner on the modem. There was this online thing happening. So I used the computer to telephone the modem into these bulletin boards where there was these conversations happening. And for the first time I felt that there was this organic kind of technology. There was something very community Amish barn raising like about it. And that was my entry was, was that was, that was when I began to rethink about technology because for the first time it didn't seem like smoke stacks and big conglomerate industrial scale technology. Here was something that was very intimate and I started paying attention to that and I started to explore that as if it was a new country. So I got a, uh, my first, one of the first magazine articles I ever wrote was exploring this online world as a new country. And I was trying to do like a tour guide to it. Um, I was taking the kind of my travel metaphor and it was called Network Nation. Um, and so um, that was the thing that kind of flipped my idea about technology and seeing a different face to it. How has it affected your worldviews, having been born into Westfield, New Jersey? Where I've been the many it, times, I might You mean add. the it being the technology? No, anything. You're oh, from I Westfield, see. New Jersey. How Westfield, does that New matter? Jersey. Yeah, well, so, so, so I, I tried to convey to my kids how parochial Westfield, New Jersey was during the 50s and 60s, where I could kind of uh, arrived at the graduating from high school never having eating Chinese food, never having picked up chopsticks, never being around uh, very people from other cultures. Um, the, the paucity in the local bookstore uh, of finding out information of how things worked, it was incredibly parochial uh, at that time. And even the kind of cuisine, the stuff that we ate, you know, macaroni and cheese, meatloaf. It was unbelievably hard. When I came back from Asia the first time, I decided I wanted to try to cook something Chinese. So I went to hunt for fresh ginger. It took me, I had to go basically travel into like Newark, New Jersey, like a big city to find an Italian uh, groceries to find fresh ginger, which of course now is available everywhere. So there was this sense of it, of, of the, 
parochial little secular isolated sense of a suburb that um, is most strong in my mind right now. Um, and, and so I feel as if um, I knew nothing and there was very little contact with things that were different or other. It was not cosmopolitan in the least. And um, that's, of course, has changed over time. But that was that's the journey that I've been on is leaving that behind. I used to think of Westfield as the bigger town. So <laughs> imagine my upbringing. <laughs> where, where did you grow up? Well, I was born in Kearney, New Jersey, right next yeah. to Newark, but mostly grew up in Hillsdale, which was yeah. a sleepy town of 20,000 people. And uh, the chess club, we would go play Westfield. They were like the big, strong chess club <laughs> from the big place. And we were afraid of them because they were from Westfield. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it's all relative, right? For me, <laughs> I, I felt this was a small town and, and some of the small towned uh, parochial sense of it was, was for me, and the reason why I left, basically, at, right after high school, and, and only recently went back after 50 years from my 50-year uh, high school reunion, and I went back, and the main thing I wanted to see was uh, when I was 17, I planted an acorn in our backyard, a, a little seedling from an acorn, and I said, I want, I'm i hoping that this tree will grow to be a huge tree in 50 years. And I went back, and the tree was there in the same yard, and it was a magnificent, huge oak tree. And I just felt very proud that I was um, being a good ancestor. Long-termism, right? Exactly. Last two questions. First, what's the last thing you've changed your mind about? So, um, yeah, the, 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 the last thing, uh, and I have to say this kind of very, very cautiously, but I have... Been, dis been deciding that I think um, I, I think the Civil War was a mistake, that we should have, we, the Union, should have left this, the South to succeed. If, if, if the majority of people who were voting had voted for it, and, and that the, um, and that the, you know, the right of the Union to enforce that Union, I think was a mistake. Um, and the, all the and the number of people's died, the division that it caused, and, and everything else was um, uh, wrong, and that that it would have been better to have left the South to succeed. And I think that's, I mean, that's a kind of uh, recently came to that conclusion. But wouldn't slavery just have gone on for a very long time? I don't think so. So you it think it would have it, ended it, be, for not being profitable enough, or right, just it, it, slave it, owners it, would have given up all that wealth? I think I think it ended for the same reason it ended all the other places in the, in the world, and I think so. I, I think maybe it would not have ended as fast, but I think it would have um, proven to to have not withstand industrialization. I'll mention your book again before the final question. Excellent advice for living, wisdom I wish I'd known earlier. Last question: Now that your book is out or coming out, what will you do next? I'm working on a, a project called The 100-Year Desirable Future. I think it's really important to try and visualize where it is that we want to go with all this technology because I think it's hard enough to get there deliberately and it's almost impossible to get there inadvertently. And so I think having a, a, a vision, a destination of where it is that we want to go is helpful. And, and that's actually, it's difficult. It's much easy to imagine how things don't work because that's more probable. Failure is, is the norm. And so seeing how high all this AI could work is really hard to see. How is there a world in which we have ubiquitous AI, ubiquitous genetic engineering, constant surveillance? Where is that? How is that a world that we want to live in? I'm trying to imagine what that is with a, a set of scenarios that would say, here's a possible future of this high tech that could work. And I call it the 100 year desirable future or protopia. Kevin Kelly, a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Tyler, you always ask the very best questions. I just love it. Each one of them made me really think hard, which is a real joy when you're doing these kinds of interviews. So thank you very much.